All right, well, we, uh, we started a new series last week, and it was called the topic, it's on the topic of prayer. It's called Communicating with God or Communication with God. And uh, I kind of gave you a real basic, a real basic uh, introduction. We talked about uh, knowledge of God. And we know that knowledge is incredibly important, but on what level? We talked about an informal knowledge of God. We talked about an intellectual knowledge of God. And we talked about an intimate knowledge of God. These are all really crucial uh, aspects of knowledge, but the most important is an intimate knowledge with God. Where are you in your intimacy with Him? Are you able to say to yourselves, yes, I have an intimate knowledge knowledge with God. I have an experiential knowledge of God. Or are you saying to yourself that I have an academic and informational or an intellectual knowledge of God? Hopefully by the end of this series we'll be uh, discussing things on an intimate level. Now by way of introduction I want to say that we did a series about um, a year ago called Finding Purpose and the topic of prayer came up and and uh, though I don't think I actually preached on it, it, uh, it came up in, in, uh, in an outline format. And I said, you know, there's just way too much information on prayer to cover in one message. So what I have done is I've created a series on the topic of prayer that will span many, many weeks and uh, will be way better, way more thorough than one message on the topic of prayer. We're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn what real communication with God is. And then we're going to apply it to our lives. Not only are we going to learn about it, I want people to experience it. I want people to experience what real prayer is. Matter of fact, our theme this year is is, uh, is saturate. We want to saturate ourselves in God's Word. We want to saturate ourselves in God. We want to saturate ourselves in prayer. And we actually had wristbands that were made. They look like this. And it says, Saturate 2019 as our theme. And we're going to give these out to everybody when we leave as a reminder to pray, as a reminder to be in God's Word, as a reminder to love Him. I don't want anybody to leave this year, 2019, and say, I did not saturate myself in God, in His presence, in His plan for my life. So let's get on with our message. The first thing I want you to write down when pertaining to the function of prayer, that is the the message this morning, the function of prayer, I want you to write down point one, the the communication of prayer. The communication. When I ended last week, I said essentially prayer is communication with God. That is uh, us communicating to Him. And you and I both know that we want God communicating to us. We want the God of heaven speaking into our lives. And we have that right here with the Word of God. We have Him speaking into our lives with His Word. This is the primary way that God speaks to us. Now we know that the Holy Spirit does a, does a part in speaking into our lives, but this is the primary way that God speaks to us. And let me tell you this, that we don't get enough of this either. We are lacking in experiencing God speaking into our lives when it comes to the Word of God, and we have it right here. We say we want God speaking to us. And yet many times we pass over the Bible. We forget about these things. I was uh, given a story this week. I thought I'd, uh, thought I'd highlight a couple things and, and read it to you because I thought it was really impressing in my life. And the title is, How Much Do You Cherish God's Word? And I've redacted quite a bit of things here, but I just want to give you the, 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 the bones. And here's what it says. A hard worker, William, eventually earned the spot of quarry superintendent. Though he had a number of admirable traits, he tended to be a bit impatient at times. One day, he impatiently 
or his impatience got the best of him, and he grabbed a live stick of dynamite. It exploded while he was hovered over it. The accident left him with no hands, little feeling in his face, and no eyesight. He was entirely dependent on others to live. On several occasions before, others had tried to share Christ with him. Now, due to his accident, he was in a place to listen. He gave his heart to the Lord in the coming months, but was not satisfied by simply having someone read Scripture to him. He longed for the ability to read it for himself. Day in and day out, he lived in darkness and solitude. One day he learned of a young girl, blind girl, who had learned Braille and was able to read her Bible with her fingertips. Over time, this young girl lost the feeling in her own hands. At the very end, she brought the Bible to her lips one day to kiss it goodbye, and to her amazement, she discovered that she could feel the raised letters with her lips. He had lived in blackness for five years when God sent a blind girl named Anna Johnson to the home to work with some of the blind patients. He had no hands and no feeling in his face, so the techniques the little girl had adopted wouldn't work. One day, William asked Anna, when she was about to go home for the day, if she could leave with him one of the little cards they had been practicing with. He kept trying to feel the little raised bumps with different parts of his body. When he realized that he had not prayed and asked God for help, so he earnestly begged God for help. The next time he raised the card to his lips, his tongue slipped out and brushed the paper. To his amazement, he could feel the raised letters with his tongue. William learned how to read Braille with his tongue. In the 65 years that followed and after much bleeding and sores, William read the entire Bible four times with his tongue. And his example leaves those of us who can see without any excuse. He knew that God was speaking to him through the word and he wanted to read it for himself. And we have the word. This is how God communicates to us. And we communicate to him through prayer. And unfortunately, many Christians do not pray as they ought to pray. I have a few statistics I would like to read you. Some of these statistics are pretty shocking. And of course, as any Pastor, I have to give commentary as I read these statistics. Here are some of the statistics. A survey conducted online between June 5th and 9th of 2017 by Barna Group uh, polls shows that many Americans still rely on prayer as a means to communicate with God, which is shocking to me. That Americans will say, that people will say, yes, this is how we communicate to God. I mean, that is shocking to me because I think there is an absence of this in our culture. The study shows that prayer is the most common faith practice among adults. Listen to this. With 79% of the population, this will get you, engaging in prayer at least once in the last three months. Not once in the last three days or three weeks, but the last three months. I read something somewhere, and I, I can't believe this statistic. I, I think this, is, this is, must be wrong, although they say about 93.5% of the statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> Within all the statistics, there was somewhere in between 45 and 55% of Christians pray every day. I, I just cannot believe that. I, I guess I just don't believe it. The Barna Group, or the Barna Research Group, says that 28% of people who have no faith say that they have prayed at least once in the last three months. I don't get that. Is isn't prayer isn't prayer a a, a a means of expressing faith to God? I don't know how 28% of people who have no faith say that they pray in faith. I, I don't get that. But anyway, 25% of people 
who are non-Christians say the same. So 25% of people who are not Christians and 28% of people who have no faith at all pray. That doesn't make any sense to me either. 15% of people who are of other faith also say the same thing. So you've got 28% of people who have no faith, 25% of people who are not Christians, and 15% of people who are of other faiths say that they've prayed at least once in the last three months. This one was interesting. This one kind of hit home to me. An Ellis Research Survey for Facts and Trends finds just 16% of pastors are very satisfied with their personal prayer lives. 47% are somewhat satisfied, 30% somewhat dissatisfied, and 7% very dissatisfied. Pastors, the ones who are supposed to be leading the charge, are very dissatisfied, but can I share something with you from my heart? Is that even I am very dissatisfied with how much I pray to God. I'm not one who says, man, I am just, just rocking it out, man. I'm praying like without ceasing. No, I would say that I would fall within the 7% of very dissatisfied. The median amount of prayer time per day is 30 minutes for a pastor, 30 minutes a day. Now, I'll have to admit, I pray less than that at times. There are times I pray more than that. That's why they say the median. Here's how their time is broken up. During that time, a typical pastor spends 12 minutes with prayer requests, eight minutes in quiet time, which I'm not exactly sure how that works, but whatever. Eight minutes in quiet time, seven giving thanks, seven more in praise, and five confessing sin. I spend more time, the bulk of my time, confessing my sin to God. Which isn't necessarily a good thing in terms of my sin, but that's what I do. I spend a lot of my time asking the Lord to forgive me and help me to be a better man, to be a better Christian, to be a better dad, to be a better husband. I spend a lot of time doing that. Lord, forgive me. The top five things they pray for are individual congregation members' needs, congregation's spiritual health, wisdom in leading the church, spiritual growth for church, and personal spiritual growth. That's kind of how they broke it down. That's how pastors pray with the poll that they took. Now there's an irony because uh, I think that we get busier, don't we? I remember the times when I was my, my kid's age and I was, this word does not, I don't even know this word anymore. This doesn't enter my vocabulary, but they, they come to me and they say, Dad, I'm bored. <laughs> they just wait. <laughs> I'm looking for boredom in my life at some point in time, right? But we get busier and busier, and I realize that the busier we get, the less we pray, but more that prayer is needed. Just because we're busy doesn't mean that we should, we should have less prayer. It means we should step it up a bit, and we should pray more to help us get through our busyness. If prayer is communication with God, why do we do so little of it? If prayer is communication with God, why aren't we praying more? He has given us this invaluable resource where he speaks to us primarily through his word, and we don't do that. And at the same time, when we could be sending up prayers to our heavenly Father, we don't even do that. I may have mentioned this before, but my, uh, my dad is, he's really old. I think he's 65 he, um, he's really old. He's, I mean, got one foot. Well, whatever. He said to me one time, he said, he said, uh, he said Joe, he says, I would do anything. We were talking about, uh, we were talking about uh, iPhones, videos and things. And I said, it's amazing, you know, you don't have to get this, uh, this big reel, you know. Apparently, they used to watch TV and film on a big reel that would go click, 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 click. I don't know what that's about. I think they called it an 8-track. <laughs> anyway, so, but they, you, 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 to capture video used to be really, really hard. I mean, you needed a, almost a master's degree to do it, and, and now you just got any, 
goofball out there with his iPhone, filming anything and everything. And you know, those are the ones that get all the likes on Facebook, I'm just saying. That, uh, but anyway, so you, they're doing all this filming, and, and, and my, my dad says to me, he says, he says, Joey, film, film your kids. But he says, do this. He says, make sure that you're in the film. He says, make sure that you're in the film. And he says, I would give anything to see my dad for 60 seconds. He would do anything to talk with his dad one last time. His dad is, has been dead now for years. No joke, he actually got struck by lightning. I think that's what killed him. Anyway, so it does happen. He'd give anything. And I would venture to guess if you were to ask my dad, Dad, would you be willing to, to read a letter from your dad in Braille with your tongue? I bet he would say, yes, Joe, I'll do anything as long as I can get a letter from him, as long as I can get to know him. And we have all the means necessary for him to talk to us and all the means necessary for us to talk to him, and yet we don't pray as much as we should. On your verse sheet in Psalm 17, 6, David said, I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me and hear my speech. David was certain that God of the universe was going to hear him. Asaph said in Psalm 77, 1, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice. Jesus gave us this wonderful prescription. For those of us who don't know how to pray, this isn't the Lord's prayer. Can I say that? People say that this is the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6. They say, this is, this is the Lord's prayer. No, this is what the Lord said on, for us how to pray. In this prayer, he, there's a confession of sin, and we know that Jesus doesn't confess sin. So this isn't Jesus, this isn't the Lord's prayer. This is the disciples' prayer. And he says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. And he gives this nice way we can communicate with God. He gives us the principles that we need to be able to pray to our Heavenly Father. He hasn't left us without. He hasn't left us lacking. He says, you can pray and I will hear you. Prayer is a, is a, is a vital thing in the Bible. A vital. 220 prayers are mentioned. Over 220 prayers are mentioned in the Bible with literally hundreds of, of verses and surrounding context. This isn't something God just made up in the end and he says, you know, uh, pray. This is something that is woven through the fabric of Scripture. Over 220 actual prayers. Over 500 verses that mention pray, prayer, praying, and prayed. Over 500. This isn't something that just is an accident. This is our means to communicate to God. Can I tell you this? That my dad, my dad lives in, in Minnesota, and uh, there are all, all manner of ways that I can communicate with him. I can, uh, I can send him a text message, which he will respond in a very dad text message like, which is usually uh, Simple and encrypted, <laughs> which I sometimes have trouble reading it. But anyway, so he, I can text him. He can text back. I can, uh, I can call him on the phone, and, and usually, uh, usually he won't answer. But nonetheless, I can call him on the phone, and, and uh, I, I, I do thank God for, for Apple. We can FaceTime. I can actually see him. Usually, he doesn't aim the camera right. And I only see part from here to here. And I, don't, I mean, I hope he's wearing something when I'm looking at it, when I'm talking about it. But all I can see are part of his face. That is a pet peeve of mine. So if I FaceTime you, make sure you have like a picture body of you, you know, make sure you're wearing something. There are all manner of ways that I can communicate with my dad. But there is but one way we communicate with God. There is but one way. I, I love the Jewish people. We were just in Israel. I love the Jewish people. I honor them. I, 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 I appreciate them very much. But when we are at the Western Wall and we see them putting prayers on slips of paper and putting them in the walls, it's disheartening. It's saddening. It's not, it's not exciting. It is exciting to see that they have a desire to speak to their God. But all we have to do is pray. We pray, and that's how we communicate with our Heavenly Father. So the function of prayer is communication. It's also communion. It's also communion. Communion is defined as this, the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings. 
the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings. The function of prayer is communion, uh, or it's the maintenance of our relationship with God. It's essentially bringing the sinner into fellowship with the Savior. It's when we can commune together. Uh, prayer brings about this intimacy with our Lord. And with so few Christians praying, it's no wonder we have such a malnourished society. If this is what brings us into intimacy, into close communion with our Heavenly Father, it's no wonder with, 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 with these statistics, it's no wonder why there's such spiritual malnourishment. It's not hard to get close to God. Uh, Psalm 145.18 says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him. You want to be close to God? You've got to call upon Him. What does that require? That requires prayer. You know, my children and I have a, have a relationship. We have a, a father-son relationship. And regardless of our communion with one another, we will still have always that relationship with one another, a father-son relationship. But I tell you what, that greater relationships happen because of greater communion. I want to be close to my children. I don't want them at hand distance. I want them to be close to me. Jesus even wanted to commune with his father, so even he prayed. How did he do it? He prayed. Mark 1.35 says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and prayed. Luke 6.12 says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. This is Jesus who goes out and prays to his heavenly father to commune with him. I tell you what, a lot of these verses, there, there, there are, there's such... Great depth in these verses. We're going to use some of these verses over and over and over again. This is how even Jesus communed with God. Prayer is the way we commune with him. R.A. Torrey said, There is no greater joy on earth or in heaven than communion with God, and prayer in the name of Jesus brings us into communion with him. Prayer is how we do it. It's how we get close to him. The joy of having prayer answered is never as great as having communion with him. Now I understand though that the more that we have communion with God, the more our prayers are going to be answered. And people will say, is there any way to get all your prayers answered? And I say, yes there is. Ask things that God already wants you to have. Just ask for the things he already wants you to have. Well, how do you know what God wants you to have through what he has said to you? So God tells me something, and then I pray to him, and I say, God, I want to only have what you want me to have. And you know what? He's going to give it to me. He's going to give it to me. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. We ask it according to his will. Lord, what do you want for my life? How do we find out what he wants for our life? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I love communing with my Lord. This is the time when you get to get to spend with Him, sometimes with no agenda. Isn't that wonderful that you can spend time with no agenda with the Lord? You know, the Lord knows what we need. The Lord knows what we need before we ask it. But isn't it fun just to go to him and say, Lord, this is my feeling right now. This is what's going on in my life. And you just go to him and, and you know that the Lord is going gonna, is gonna to help bear that burden. Now we go to him with thanksgiving and gratefulness and we go to him uh, with prayer and supplica uh, supplication and we do this and that is all good. But there are times that I just go to my God and I say, Lord, I don't even know what to say. And I just want to spend time with you. And there are times it's, it's almost quiet. No agenda, no Lord, 
I pray for this, and I'm asking you to do this, and I'm asking you to do this. This isn't a laundry list. This is communion. I, 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 sometimes my kids and I will, will, will do something. And, um, but we'll do something that, that's, that has no real agenda to it, technically. You know? There's no real, like, this is what the plan is. This is just them and I. There are times, and, and the kids, they'll, they'll have Legos in, in here. everywhere and if you're here during the week you'll know exactly what I mean and uh, sometimes I'll just come in and I'll just I'll just get down on the floor and I'll just I'll start stacking blocks no agenda nothing I color coordinate the blocks though It's, it probably has something to do with OCD, but I, I, so there is an agenda. I show them how to do this right. <laughs> the red ones, the yellow ones, no mingling. No agenda, just communing. Do you do that with your Lord? Do you, do you pray? Do you just sit down in your quiet time and do you close your eyes and do you just say, Lord, no agenda? Man, I love you. I've got all sorts of needs, you know them. But I just want to talk with you, Lord, and just share with you maybe just a burden of mine, and, and I don't have to have an answer. But this is what I'm struggling with. There are times I, I, I do that. Th- this week, and it's funny, the Lord will answer those. He'll answer those. Even though, even though you're not necessarily asking Him, He'll answer them. This, this couple weeks ago, I broke a tooth on a cookie. It's a $2,100 cookie. <laughs> Very expensive cookie, and I uh, went in to see the went in to see the dentist, and uh, and uh, left, and and uh, one lady she called me and she says we, you know the the, the doctor the dentist knows that uh, how much that you mean uh, this family means to you and want to bless this family and and I said what we're going to do is we're going to basically do everything for free and you just pay the lab fees, and you know what my prayer was as I drove away and I saw this like estimate. You know, 2100 bucks. I thought, Lord, I don't even know. I said, I'm coming to you, Lord. I, I don't have an answer. I mean, I, I could, I mean, it's a lot of money. Not exactly $2,100. It's like, I guess unless you're Bill Gates, it's pocket change, you know. But I said, Lord, no agenda. I don't know. A few hours later, God, I say God, because it was God. I said, you know what? We're going we're gonna to be able to fix this tooth for 400 bucks or, or less. Who knows? Just communing with God. No agenda. Just sharing my burden with Him. A constant state of communion. The function of prayer is communion as well as communication. It's also a command. It's also a command. The Bible speaks of many commands when it comes to prayer. And I'm going to give you just a glimpse of these. We're not going to cover them in totality. We're going to revisit a lot of these verses in, in other, in other uh, messages. But let me just give you a handful of commands. First of all, Matthew 26, 41, and watch and pray. That's a wonderful command. Romans 12, 12, rejoice and hope, patient tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. How long do we wait before we begin to pray to our God when he says be instant in prayer? When something is bothering us, when we need communion with our Heavenly Father, he says be instant in prayer, do it right away. And so often we, we wait and we wait and we wait before we actually begin to ask and talk to our Father. It could be because we have a a, a misunderstanding of our Heavenly Father. You know, when my kids have done something, I want them to come talk to me right away. If they've broken something or, or if they've done something, I want them to come talk to me right away. We can fix this thing together. And we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. These are commandments. These aren't options, they're obligations. He says, pray without ceasing. Luke 18, 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now God is not going to tell us to do something that we cannot do. 
So there must be a way that we can always be in a constant state of prayer, else he wouldn't have said it. And I think that a person can be in a constant state of prayer, in their subconscious even, where they are constantly and continually thinking about their Heavenly Father and talking with Him. Heard an example recently of a, of a mother who will wake up in the middle of the night when her baby cries. She is sound asleep, and in her subconscious she'll wake up, it will wake her up, and she will go tend to the baby. When we began to pastor here, we would, uh, five years ago, we would drive from here to Chicago. We did that for seven months. And uh, we'd leave after Sunday night service and fellowship, and uh, we'd get home midnight or so, because I had to work at 5 a.m. So I was up, I had to be there. And so my wife would, would always, uh, she would drive. The vast majority of the time, she does all right. We made it, I'm still alive. Um, <clears throat> thank God for those rumble strips. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, probably routinely, though, I'm out cold. When I sleep, I don't mess around. I do this. I do this thing right, okay? So I sleep like a rock. I'm out. And with the exception of the rumble strips. In my subconscious, I wake up to the rumble strips. And I'm like, ah, what's going on? She's like, nothing, nothing, nothing. And okay, go back to sleep. So I went to sleep. And, but almost routinely, we would pull into our, into, our, into our garage. And there was about a one-inch bump in our garage. One inch, you know, because they kind of go in there. It's not a big one. It's just a nice clean little bump, pull in there. And uh, pretty much every time we did that, I would wake up and say, oh, you want me to drive for you? <laughs> Somewhere in my, in my subconscious, even though I was pretty much unconscious, I, would, uh, I knew when we were home. I knew when we were home. I think we can be in a constant state of prayer, praying to God. Not praying for others, not praying in general is a sin. Prayerlessness is a sin because God has commanded us to pray. He commanded us to pray. Oswald Chambers said, For whom am I withholding God's blessing by failing to pray for them? It's our fault when others don't get blessed because we're not praying for them. In 1 Samuel 12, 23, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He knew it was a sin to stop praying because God's commanded us to pray without ceasing. Never take it for granted. John R. Rice said, My greatest sin and yours is prayerlessness. The lack of souls saved in my ministry is primarily because of a lack of prayer, not because of a lack of preaching. The withering away of joy in my heart sometimes is the fruit of prayerlessness. My indecision, my lack of wisdom, my lack of guidance come directly out of prayerlessness. All the times I have fallen into sin, have failed in my duties, have been bereft of power or disconsolate for lack of comfort, I can charge to the sin of prayerlessness. He says this, it just struck me, my failures are all prayer failures. We need to pray more. We need to pray more. This is how we communicate with God. This is how we commune with Him. And this is a command. So to not pray, to not be intimate with our Lord, is a sin. And so we need to get right before God. I think a lot of us abide in this sin of prayerlessness. I think we're so quick to run to another source for answers as opposed to go directly to the throne of grace. We need God in our lives. He has spoken to us through His Word, and we speak to Him through prayer. How desperate are you to speak to God? Are you as desperate to hear from God as William was? That you're willing to read the Bible with your tongue? 
That thought just eludes me. That is a man who really wanted to know God. And you know what? God really wants to know us. He really wants us to talk with Him. And my prayer is that we can all, as a church, begin to pray more. Prayer works, friends. Prayer works all the time, every time. And it's sad that we have such a, an easy way to communicate with God, and yet we lack the one thing, which is prayer. And so my goal, my hope, is that I pray, and, I, and this is my, my prayer, is that we can all pray together as a church. We pray for, pray for each other. We pray for the needs of one another. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our health. We pray for the church. Let us never forget that. Friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you were to say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going when I die. I don't know where I'm going. I'm, I'm confused. I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to work my way. If this is your prayer to God, can I, can I share something with you? That in God's Word, He shares with us what it takes in order to get to heaven. The Bible is so clear when it comes to salvation. It could never be any more clear. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. And I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. Every one of us is a sinner. The Bible says that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Here we are with our sin. Now listen, friends. Turning over a new leaf doesn't, doesn't get you to heaven. Praying a certain prayer doesn't get you to heaven. Coming to this church won't get you to heaven. The Bible, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's the penalty. The penalty for this sin is death. Someone has to die. That's the penalty. Either you die and spend an eternity separated from God forever, or you trust 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for you. The wages of sin was death. Someone had to die. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not a prayer. It's not giving money to the church. It's not coming to church. It's when you in the quietness of your mind say, Lord, the best I know how, I believe, I trust, I'm depending, relying upon Jesus Christ to save me. If you've done that, instantaneously, you are saved. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which you can do, which we can do, but according to His mercy, He saves us. That's salvation. It's when we trust, depend, rely upon Jesus Christ to save us. It's not because we got water baptized. It's not because we live a good life. And can I say this? We all live a rotten, stinking life. Every single one of us. So the best life that you can live ever is not good enough to get you to heaven. We need a payment, and that payment is death separation. Someone had to die and be separated from God the Father. You know what he did? He went into the lower parts of the earth. Three days later, he rose from the grave. He was separated for a moment from his Father. Salvation is when you place your faith in him as your personal Savior. And I pray you've done that. I pray that you do that before you leave this place. And I pray that in the weeks ahead, we can learn to have an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Sometimes with even no agenda that we can go to Him and just say, Lord, I love you. Maybe the agenda is just thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord.